Yeah. All right, guys, uh, let's get started. So, can you tell me what's the, what does you know, Justin Bieber and Obama care has in common? <laughs> now, let me say again who hates Justin Bieber? It's okay, that's fine. Remember how cool Justin was back then? You know, the Bieber? See, the comment between these two, that everybody hates them. Or, or better yet, we all love to hate them. But can you guys give me a reason why you hate Justin Bieber? Anybody? Okay, okay, yes? Too popular? No, okay. Uh huh. Okay. All right. Let's let's look at this Obamacare, guys. Really, if you if you are pres um, running for the president and if you're Republican, you you must hate Obamacare. You have to hate Obamacare. I mean, you know, Mike Huckabee, you know, Jeb Bush, Chris Christie, everybody here, you know, even <laughs> even including your very popular right now, you know, what's this guy's name? <laughs> Donald Trump. All right, Donald Trump. You're gonna hate Obamacare. But guys, really, Donald Trump, I mean, just the hair. Okay. Just, I, I love his hair. I mean, when I become older, I want to have hair just like his. Okay? So, why? Why does everybody all hate Obamacare? You know, guys, really, if, you, if you're running for president and if you're a Republican, maybe somewhere there's a checklist. Now, on the checklist, it says, you know, file for your federal election form one and two. Check. Fundraising. Check. Set up a super PAC, check. And then make sure you hate Obamacare, check. <laughs> and then better yet, make sure everybody knows you hate Obamacare, <laughs> check. So why do they hate Obamacare? So today, we're gonna to talk about the rationale for Obamacare, so why we have Obamacare, and I will go through the law of what or the, or the, the law actually does. Now, um, let's look at the public health system before 2014, so before Obamacare. So before Obamacare, the only thing can really call the public health from the, from the federal government is a program called Medicare. You guys all heard it before, right? Medicare? Now, any idea what it's for? Old people? Okay. So, so Medicare was set up back in 1965. It was signed in law by President Lyndon Johnson. And then um, it was under the Social Security Act of 1965. Now, for the Medicare ID number 000001 was a guy named Harry Truman who happened to be the 33rd president of America. Now the reason why Henry Truman was number one on the list is because his way was very, very different. So if you compare all the presidents we have so far, you know, President Obama, President Bush, President Clinton, President Bush, President Reagan, President Carter, Ford, Nixon, Lyndon Johnson, and then Kennedy, what do they all have in common? Any idea? Okay, that's fine. They're all male. They're all male. Anything else? Right. Are they rich or are they poor? They're pretty rich, right? And especially if you're President Obama today, that if once President Obama leaves office, his pension, so what, the money he gets every single year, is going to be $400,000 until he die. A lot of money. But that wasn't the case with Harry Truman. When Harry Truman retired, there was no lifetime pension. So when he retired, the only income he has was the army pension for $112 per month. And then a small family farm in Missouri. That was it. Now, Harry Truman was so poor that when he left office, he went to the bank. He borrowed $3,000. He was poor. So by 1965, 13 years later, he was so poor, he couldn't pay with his own medical bill. And now our government <laughs> noticed this. If the ex-president who, who, who couldn't pay for his own medical bill, then what about everybody, everybody else? What about, what about your grandparents? What about your neighbor down the street? How do they pay for medical bills? So to help them pay for medical bill, we set up this thing called oh, Medicare. And then for Medicare, today, to qualify for Medicare, there's three criteria. The first, you have to be over age 65, so you must be retired. And then second, you must be disabled. And then third, and only for the third reason, that if you have you know, renal disease or renal failure, and need a kidney transplant, you can be put on this Medicare. 
Does anybody here know anybody need a kidney transplant or renal failure? Do you know why it's so special? Guys, heard something called dialysis. What does dialysis do? Right, filter our blood, right? Guys, really, your, your kidney, kidney is like a filter in your system. They filter your blood, make your blood clean. If your kidney stop working, your blood become dirty, poisoned. So you're gonna die in a couple, couple weeks. So for anybody who has a kidney failure, you need a transplant. Before the transplant, you need dialysis. And depends on how severe your, your disease is, you're gonna be on dialysis you know, two, three, four times a week. And that is a very, very expensive treatment. So for patients, they have a hard time getting insurance to cover for it. And in many insurance companies, they just drop them. You need a kidney transplant, we don't drop you, too expensive. So they have nowhere to go. So where do they go? They go to the federal government, Medicare, okay? Now, for Medicare today, we have four parts. So part A, part B, part C, part D. Part A is truly free. So part A is your hospital visit. Part B is your medical insurance. So when patients go to the, the doctor's office getting treatment, they use part B. And part B pays 80-20. So the insurance pays 80, patients pays 20. And then part C is called medical, uh, Medicare Advantage, uh, allow a third-party company to run Medicare system. And then Part D was pretty new, uh, is the Medicare Prescription Drug Plan. Now, for all these services over here, you gotta pay for it. Medicare is not free. So for this Medicare payment, if you have Part A, now Part A is free. But for Part B, you gotta pay for it. And for Part B, in 2012, your premium, how much you pay every month, depends on how much income you have. And then for most retirees and for, for most disabled people, their payment is only about $96 per month. And then if your income goes higher, your payment goes higher as well. And then the, the max, the max is only set as 308 per month. Now part C, part D, that depends on how, which plan you have, and that's how much you pay for it. So there's also a deductible, there's also co-insurance. So for any patient who is on Medicare, their deductible is only $155 per year. That means every year, you pay the first 155, and after that, the insurance covers 80% of that. This is a very, very generous payment. Guys, when I was working for the private sector, my insurance for my company, my monthly payment was $230 per month for myself. And then my deductible for the entire year was $4,000. That means every year I pay the first $4,000 and the insurance pays the, pays the, the next 80%. So if you compare an older retiree and then me over here, who needs more medical service? The retiree, right? So how is it possible that this retiree pays lower payment compared to I do? Any idea? Subsidized by the government? It's because the, those Medicare patients, for how much they pay, is only a small part of the total bill. The big portion of the total bill is paid by you guys over here. It's our tax. It's the Medicare tax. So for the Medicare tax, this is how it works. If you work, you make a paycheck, you pay Medicare tax. And then for the Medicare tax rate, it's 2.9% of your first $120,000. And I started from 2013, for any portion of an income that's over $200,000, you pay an extra 3.8% tax. So now, the more income you have, the more Medicare tax you pay. So this is where the money comes from. Now, have you guys heard that Medicare is on virtual bankruptcy? The Medicare is in trouble? Yeah, it is. Medicare is almost bankrupt. It is almost bankrupt. And there are a couple of reasons why Medicare is almost bankrupt. So we're gonna go through each reason. Now the first reason why Medicare is almost bankrupt is because there is a rising medical cost. Now remember, this law was set up back in 1965. Now in 1965, can we do a heart transplant? Can we do a brain surgery? We can't. But today we can do them. It costs money. Okay, so this is the biggest reason. The second reason, well, um, I know I'm being taped, so this is gonna sound very bad. So the second reason why Medicare is almost bankrupt is very simple, it's just that people don't die. And that's a problem. It is. Guys, back in 1965, when this law was first introduced, so average life expectancy, so on average how, how long does American live, was only 69 years. Today it's 78 years, that's good. But that also means for an average patient, they're gonna be on Medicare for 13 years. Before it was only four years. So the longer time they're on Medicare, the more money they spend, Medicare is in trouble. 
And then the third reason is that this system only works because we have people like you guys working. The more money you guys pay, the more money you guys pay in check, pay, pay your, pay your tax, the more money we have in Medicare. But for our generation, for our population, it's getting older and older. Now, have you guys heard of a group called Baby Boomers? Yes? Do you know who they are? Your, your parents' generation, right? So it's pretty much the population of America who were born between 1945, so right after World War II, and then beginning of Vietnam War. So this little gap over here, we call them the baby boomers. And the reason why we call them baby boomers is because there is a, if you look at the population distribution, around this time, there's a little bump for population. That as the soldier come back home, you know, they got really busy, so <laughs> we have more babies. That's what we call baby boomers. Guys, let's, let's do a little math, okay? Take 2015 minus 1945. How many years is this? 70, right? That means your first wave of baby boomers, they are now going into retirement. They are now leaving the workforce. They are now going on to Medicare and require government assistance. So now, with more baby boomers going into retirement, the number of workers goes down, the number of recipients goes up, and this ratio is changing. So in 1965, when we first set up this Medicare, it was about five workers for every one recipient. By 2007, it becomes three workers for every one recipient. And by 20, 2032, so about another 15 years later, it will become only two workers for every one recipient. That means by then, for anybody to use Medicare, there must be two people paying for it. So if you think your tax is high now, it will be even higher later on. Make sense? All right, so the last reason is anytime we have an economic downturn, so economy going down, Medicare in trouble. Well, very simple. Why do we, what, what happening when economy goes down? Unemployment, right? Layoffs, no paycheck. No paycheck, do you still pay a Medicare tax? You don't. So with any economic downturn, Medicare is in trouble. And for last recession, back in 2008, Medicare was in huge trouble, okay? So simple numbers, 144,000 versus 355,000. Any idea what it means? What it stand for? The first number, 144,000, that's how much you're gonna pay into the system. So if, so if you start working at age 25, and then retire by age 65, for 40 years, for 40 years, on average, you pay into Medicare for $144,000. And then you retire at age 65, you, let's say if you get lucky, you passed away at age 78, for, such, for 13 years, you're gonna use Medicare for $355,000. This is very unbalanced. You're paying 144, you're getting out 355. Of course, Medicare is almost bankrupt. Anything we can do? Anybody here been to Canada? Do you guys like Canada? I, I like Canada. Um, I especially like to watch Canada on South Park. <laughs> uh, in South Park, well, how do those people look like? Square people, right? Okay. So Canada can be an example for us. Because in Canada, they have a different system. In Canada, they have a, what is called a universal health care system. So in Canada, everybody is covered. Everybody's insured. If you're a citizen of Canada, you have automatic insurance. So everybody's insured. Pretty good. Now, here's how it works. In Canada, they don't have a special tax for the health care. Like guys, let me see here, who, who pay your own taxes? Okay, many of you. Did you ever get a receipt from government that says for the money you paid last year, this much went to you know, army, this much went to education, this much went to highway? No? Well, the reason why, because for all those spending, they're our government discretionary spending. So they can increase, decrease as they want. The difference with Medicare tax, Medicare tax for us only depends on how much money we collect in. There's a limit on there. But for the army spending, for education, for highways, there is no limit. We need more money, we we'll ask for money. Same thing with Canada. With their healthcare system, it's coming from general funding. There is no limit on there. They need more money, they ask for more money. So for their system, they will never go bankrupt. As long as the country is good, they will never go bankruptcy. Now, two numbers, 3895 and 7290. So if you take 
the entire healthcare spending in Canada, divided by every single person in Canada, each person is responsible for about $3,800. $7,290, that is if you take our US healthcare spending, divided by every single person in America, each person spends about $7,290. So we spend more money. And there are a couple of reasons why we're spending more money. Also, if you compare the GDPs, so the, the blue line represent, the, um, represent the Canadian GDP, and the red line representing the US GDP. So for Canada, they're spending about 10% of their national income on healthcare. For US, for our country, we're spending 16% of our national income on healthcare. So for the entire country, not just per, per person, but for the entire country, we're spending more money in healthcare. Let me show you guys this list. Let's go from this column first, okay? It's over here. So what this list shows, shows between eight countries, Australia, Canada, France, Germany, Japan, Sweden, UK, US, how much do they spend on healthcare per person? So on the list, you know, we have US 7290, the highest. The second highest is what? Canada, 3895. And then the lowest is Japan, 2581. So on average, US spent more money than everybody else. And then if you look at the national spending for America, we're spending 16% of our national income on healthcare. Everybody else, no more than 11%. And then again, Japan, those they're Japanese, they're spending only 8.1% national income on healthcare. And then second, or the next column, is your percentage of government revenue that goes to healthcare. In America, 18.5% of our government revenue goes to healthcare. Now for everybody else, it's pretty comparable. 177 for Australia, 16.7 you know, for Canada, 17.6 for Germany, so it's pretty comparable. But what really tells the story is the last column. That when our government spending 18.5% of all the government revenue in healthcare system for the entire market, only representing 45% of the entire spending. Because for majority of the spending, it's coming from private sectors our private insurance, our cash patient. But for every other country, I mean, look at Japan again. Japan, they're spending 16.8% of government revenue spent on healthcare. And their 16.8% is equal to over 80% of the entire spending. So their government spend money, and this money they're spending in the, government, in the economy representing a bigger share of total spending. So if you guys pay more for something, what do you expect from this payment? Something better, right? Something better. So if you're spending more money on healthcare, then we should expect, we should, we should get back something better than everybody else. The first column is our long life expectancy. Australia, on average, people live 81.4 years. Canada, 81.3. And then see Japan over there? You guys, personally, I don't hate Japan, but they're just standing out like that. So Japan, 82.6 years. And US, 78.1 years. That means on average, a typical Japanese will all leave Americans by about 4.5 years. So they live longer. Now, does life expectancy represent a good you know, healthcare? We can make an argument for it. Then maybe in America, you know, we probably we'll, we work hard, we party hard. It's Friday, I don't forget about it, it's Friday. We party hard, and then so we'll probably die younger, right? but we have a better quality of life. That's possible, that is possible. Second column. Second column is called the infant mortality rate. It measures how many newborn babies die before the first birthday. Um, do, do you guys know any babies party hard? Like when you go to a club, you see all the baby in diapers that's on the stage. <laughs> or you see babies doing shot. No, right, they don't. So babies shouldn't die younger. But in America, our infant mortality rate, so how many babies die before the first birthday, for every 1,000 newborns, 6.9 of them will not see the first birthday. They will die before the first birthday. And for everybody else, much, much lower. Again, Japan, 2.6. Guys, what's even worse? That this number, the infant mortality rate for Cuba, is 6.8. So a baby has a better chance of surviving the first year in Cuba compared to America. And we're a developed country. We're a rich country. 
But guys, really, this number doesn't show you the entire picture. Because if you look at different group of Americans, depends on who you are, depends on where you live, depends on how much money you have, this number is very different. So if you take middle-class Americans, and if you happen to be either white or Hispanics, your infant mortality rate is only 5.5%, or 5.5. But if you happen to be black, this number for you will be 12. Much, much higher. So guys, the problem with this number over here is not about the quality of healthcare. It's about the access to healthcare. Therefore, all the stuff we have over here, can we access it? Imagine if you are a single parent. You have a newborn at home. You work in minimum wage jobs. You work in three jobs to make ends meet. And then your newborn son is sick. He's coughing. And then you're probably thinking, you know what? I need to take him to the hospital, to the doctor's office. But I can't. I gotta go to work. I cannot call in sick. I don't have sick leave. So you probably give the baby some medicine and hoping that the baby will get better. But he doesn't. It's getting worse, worse, worse. So by the time you bring the baby to the hospital, it's already too late. That's why the number is so high, okay? Now, third column is how many doctors do we have per every 1,000 people? So in America, for all the money we pay, for all the money we give to the doctors, for every 1,000 people, we have about 2.4 doctors. It's not bad. I mean, if you compare a country like Zimbabwe, that's pretty good. If you compare it to Sweden, Germany, not so good anymore. However, the only thing can be part of that we have a lot of nurses. Do we have any nurse over here? No? Okay. So, for America, for every 1,000 people, we have 10.6 nurse. That is very, very high. Now, any idea why we have so many nurses but not enough doctor? Well, to be a nurse, you don't need to do much. Two year degree associate, two year bachelor, you get a degree, you can become a nurse. To be a doctor, you need a four year bachelor, four year medical school, three year residency, and then probably one more year for specialties. So by the time you finish, you take on a lot more debt. That's why for many people, they prefer to be a nurse, not a doctor. So guys, is this picture broken? I mean, something wrong with the picture? Is our healthcare system broken? Should we fix it? Yes? We should, right? Something's wrong over here. We're paying too much. We're not getting back enough. We should fix this. Now, let's take a, take a vote over here. So between Obamacare and Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, which one is better? Oh, you guys are educated. You are educated. Um, let, me, let me show you a clip, okay? So, Obamacare is Affordable Care Act. Now, uh, this law, the full name, the legal full name, is called Patient Protection Affordable Care Act. That's the full name for it. It was signed in law on March 23rd, 2010. Now, guys, the, the, the signature in the background, that's the actual signature on the law, okay? So, this law tried to accomplish three goals. The first goal is to improve coverage for those with pre-existing conditions. Now, I'll go over, what, I'll go over later what, what that is. Second goal is to expand access of care to over 30 million Americans who currently don't have any health care. And then the third goal, the very ambitious goal, is try to reduce the long-term cost of the U.S. health care system. So three goals. And then, have, have you guys ever read the U.S. Constitution before? Anybody? The U.S. Constitution. Any idea how many pages was on the original U.S. Constitution? Four. Any idea how many page was on the Bill of Right? One. Any idea how many pages was in the De Declaration of Independence? One. Any idea how many pages in the Affordable Care Act? That's the Affordable Care Act. It has 906 pages. So guys, pretty much this country was founded on six pages of document. This one law has 906 pages. 
So let's go over some of the stuff in there, okay? <laughs> now, the first thing that I'll try to do is to try to eliminate discri dis discrimination against sick people. Now, anybody here want to be sick? Let, let, let me rephrase. Anybody here want to have cancer? That is on your to-do list? That, you know, by, by age 35, I want to have cancer. Anybody? No? So no, nobody wants to be sick, right? You're sick more than often because you're unlucky. Something happened, you don't want to happen, but you're sick. You have cancer. And once you're sick, you need health care. But guess what, guys? Insurance companies will discriminate against you if you are sick. Or they will discuss you, do, do, do against you if you were ever sick before. So if you have cancer, or if you had cancer, when you go for this health insurance, they will charge you more for it, just because your risk is higher. So this law, the first thing we do is to eliminate discriminations against sick people. So after this law is in place, I mean, it is in place now. So now when you go get a healthcare, you'll be only discriminated based on your age, your sex, your location, but no more sickness. Doesn't matter how healthy, how thick you are, you're gonna pay the same like everybody else. Make sense? Now, second thing this law will do, we're to expand our Medicaid service. You guys know what's, what is Medicaid? Yeah, for, for children, for low-income families. So, so today, or before this law, before this law for Medicaid, the eligibility is usually about 100% of your poverty. So it depends on how much money your family makes, you can be qualified for Medicaid. But for many low-income families, they have to make a choice. So if my income is right at the poverty line, if my boss gives me a raise, I take more paycheck now, but if my income goes above poverty, I lose my Medicaid. So for a lot of low-income families, they don't want to have a higher raise. They don't want to have a higher income. Because when they, lose, when they have a higher income, they lose Medicaid. So for this law, they will try to expand Medicaid to a higher level of income. But guys, however, in Texas, our Governor Perry decided to reject the money and give the money back. So in Texas, it's still very, very low. Oh, do you guys know how much is poverty? So if I have a family of four, how much money do I need to make to be under poverty? In the continuous 48 states, so not Alaska, not Hawaii, if your family income is below $20,000 for a family of four, you're below poverty. Is that a lot of money? No. But they pay for rent, pay for your car, pay for gas, pay for food. There is nothing left. For somebody to make $20,000, they are not rich. But if you make $21,000, you lose your health care because you make too much money. Okay? All right, next, we're going to set up a health insurance exchange in every state. Um, let me see a hand. Who has Allstate insurance for a car insurance? Allstate, anybody? State Farm? Um, Geico? Anybody else? Farmers? Okay, general, some, no? Uh, so and, uh, why, why do you all have different insurance companies? So when you go by auto insurance, when you go by car insurance, what makes the difference? Why do you choose one over another one? Price, right? Whatever is cheap. For healthcare, before Obamacare, before this law, it's not possible to choose. You can only go with whichever your company offer you. So there was no competition. So with this law, we're gonna set up an exchange, like a marketplace, and then all the companies can come together to compete for your business. And when that happens, we can lower the price for healthcare. So make it more competitive. Now, the third factor, or the, the, the next one, is also a very controversial one. It says that your employer needs to buy insurance for you. So for any company, more than 50 people, so if you hire more than 50 people, you have to buy insurance for your full-time employees. If you don't, you need to pay a penalty for it. And this penalty is $2,000 per person. So suppose I have, I have a company, that my company hires 50 people, and then if I don't buy insurance for my employees, my annual penalty will be $2,000 times 50. And how much money is that? That's $100,000. So we're gonna force company with more than, more than 50 employees to buy insurance for the employees. But guys, this law, this provision over here has a big loophole. 
The loophole is that you're only required to buy insurance for your full-time employee. So what I can do? I can keep one person full-time and everybody else all part-time. And just buy insurance for one person, problem solved. So one argument against Obamacare is that make it more difficult for part-timers to become full-timers. As company to incur more cost. This one is the most controversial part of the plan. It says, individuals, you must have insurance, either from your company, from your parents, from your spouse, but somehow you must have insurance. If you don't, you're going to pay a penalty for it. And this penalty depends on how much money you have. It's very different. And for this penalty, today, so today, this year, 2015, if you don't have health insurance, the penalty for you will be either $95 or 1% of your income, whichever is higher. So if you make $20,000 for the year, you don't have insurance, then when you file your taxes, you're gonna pay a penalty for $200. But by next year, by 2016, if you still don't have any insurance, your penalty goes higher. It will become either 2.5% or 695, whichever is higher. So again, if you make only 20,000, your penalty now will be over $700. Yes? The penalty goes to general fund. Goes to general fund. All right. Guys, let's think about this, okay? This provision over here, this individual mandate that forces everybody to buy insurance. Do you guys like this, this part of the law? I mean, just like what the lady said, right? We don't like something to be forced on us. We want to have choices. If I, want, if I choose not to buy insurance, you shouldn't penalize me for it. So any idea why would Obama put this provision in there? The reason why is because health insurance companies, they ask him to. So the health insurance company says that if you force me to charge the same for the sick people, you must give me some healthy people to pay for it. So we need more healthy people like you guys over here to pay for the expenses for, more the, for the sick people. That's why we force everybody to buy insurance. If you don't, you pay a penalty for it. Make sense? All right. Next, we're going to expand our Medicare Part D prescription payment plan. Do you guys know anybody has Medicare Part D payment plan? If you ask your grandparents who has Medicare, many of them has this Part D plan. Of a Part D plan, it only pays for a prescription, and depends on how much money you have, uh, how much money you pay, what kind of different plan you have, the benefit is very different. So before Obamacare, there was something called a donor hole. That for this Part D plan, on many of the plans, they will pay the first 2,000, and then they will pay after 5,000. So this Medicare Part D is good below 2,000 and above 5,000. So for any patient who's calling between, between 2,000 to 5,000, they must pay out of pocket for it. So for, for many elderly patients who rely on Social Security, who rely on Medicare, by end of the year, so to November, December, they're going to make a choice. Do I pay for my food? Do I pay for my drug? Because I have, I'm in this donor hole now. So with this Obamacare, we're going to try to eliminate this donor hole. So make payment more and then make donor hole smaller and hopefully it becomes zero. Next, we force everybody to buy insurance. If you don't have insurance, we'll penalize you. However, if you're low income and you need to buy insurance, the government will help you. So this reimbursement depends on how much money you have, and then you'll get a reimbursement up to 400% of poverty. So for family of four, for family of four, if your family annual income is below $80,000, if you're gonna buy insurance out of pocket, the government will help you pay for it. My parents, they're semi-retired, so they, they're buying this insurance right now. When they, when they were buying insurance out of pocket before Obamacare, their monthly payment was over $700 per person. Today, their monthly payment is $152 for two. So it's much, much cheaper. So for low-income families, if you want to buy insurance, the government will help you. And also, if your income is very, very low, so your income is below 150% poverty. So again, for a family of four, if your income is below $30,000 and you must pay out of pocket for insurance, how much you'll pay is maxed. It's maxed at 2% of income or just $50 for a 
for Family 4. That is very, very cheap. Now, this law requires company to buy insurance. So for any company with more than 50 employees, you've got to buy insurance for employees. However, for the very small companies, so for a company with less than 50 people, if you still choose to buy insurance, the government will help the company. They will pay, the government will pay up to 50% of how much the company pays. So a lot of people are saying that this law is against small business. But in this way, it's actually helping small business. Guys, you know, later on, once you finish your bachelor degree, once you go in, into the workforce, you want to get a job, and many of you make a choice. Do I work for a big name company that offer me benefit, or do I work for a small mom and pop shop with no benefit? Now, with this law, the small and pop shop can compete against the big companies. Because now, they can buy the insurance cheaper than the bigger companies. So they put on the same level against all the big companies. So this is actually pretty good for the small business. And next part, the law also introduced a minimum standard of healthcare. Have you guys seen a movie uh, called John Q? By Denzel Washington? Remember his son was sick? He sent in the heart transplant, and then he hold the entire ER hostage and try to do a, a heart transplant. Now, if you remember in the movie, did John Q had insurance in the movie? Yes, right? What happened? It was insufficient. That in the movie, John Q's health insurance had an annual cap. That means for the entire year, the insurance only paid this much. Now, that's, that's in the movie script. That's coming from Hollywood. That can't be real. Right? You know what, guys? That is very, very real. Now, this is before Obamacare. So before Obamacare, a lot of companies offered their employees insufficient health care. And I saw them before. I spent two years in Memorial Hermann. I saw those patients before. I saw their insurance before. There was one guy, he had cancer. He needed chemotherapy. He came in here, and his insurance, his annual benefit is only $10,000. For chemotherapy, that's enough for five shots. And that's it. You will run out. It's not enough. So with this law, we're going to set up a minimum benefit for it. That if you're getting your insurance from companies, the company must buy you sufficient amount of insurance for you. Make sense? All right. This last one is something very close to us. You guys probably all notice now that when you go to McDonald's, when you go to Burger King, that when you look at the menu, what's next to the price? Calories, right? Do you guys look at those numbers? Yeah? You know what? I, I did. I did. Last time I went to McDonald's, I went to order uh, um, those, those fried chicken nuggets. I love the fried chicken nuggets. Uh, but the calorie for it, one order, almost 700 calorie. So I ordered something else. Okay. <laughs> I ordered Big Mac. Um, so it makes a difference. So this law requires for any restaurant with more than 20 locations that on your menu, you must post your calorie count on the menu. So when you look at the menu, you, have, you see the price, you see the ingredient, you also see the calorie on there. Um, you guys been to a cheesecake factory before? Yes? Have you ever tried their factory meatloaf? No, it's, it's very good. You had to try it. It's very, very good. Um, but don't go there for lunch. Go there for dinner. Because at dinner time, they serve you a bigger portion. Now, one dinner portion of factory meatloaf it's about 1,600 calories. That's horrible. Now, any, any idea what's the excuse from Cheesecake Factory? Their excuse is that this meal of, for dinner portion should be shared. Do we share? <laughs> I don't share my food, okay? Don't ever come between me and my food, okay? All right, so, so that's what this law does. It will make consumers more conscious about what you eat, make better choices. All right, here's some pro and con for this law, for this Obamacare. Now first, there will be an impact on deficit. So this Obamacare will be financed coming from our general funding. So your tax dollar will be used to pay for this law. Now, how much the deficit is, it depends on who you ask. If you ask our CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, their answer is that the deficit will actually be reduced reduced by $143 billion in the first decade. But if you ask the Republicans, they will tell you, oh, no, 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 no. The deficit will be increased. 
will be increased by over $700 billion in the first decade. So it depends on who you ask. The answer is very different. The reason why, because they're making a lot of assumptions. And all those assumptions, so it doesn't matter who you ask, with assumptions they have, it's unreliable. So all these numbers over here, they're all just an estimate. Now, however, this law will make an impact on a number of uninsured people. So the goal for the law, according to CBO, that by 2018, we're going to reduce our number of uninsured by 32 million people. That's a lot of people. And then luckily, this month, the so US Census just released a number from 2014, so last year number. So by last year, we already reduced our number of uninsured by over 8.8 .8 million people. So over 8 million people now have insurance because of this law. They can now go to a hospital because of this law. They can go to a doctor's office because of this law. Our national spending for this law for the first decade, for the first 10 years, will be over $940 million. Or I'm sorry, $940 billion. That's a lot of money. And we're going to find a way to pay for it. And this is how we pay for it. So there will be new tax. The new tax will finance about half of this law. So the new tax for the first 10 years will total to about $409 billion. And for this $409 billion, the $210 billion will be coming from an increase of Medicare tax. So the extra 3.8%, that will be about $210 billion. And then second, that for the entire healthcare insurance industry, so for all the healthcare insurance companies, there will be an industry-wide tax. And this tax will be $6 billion per year. We don't have any tax on auto, auto industry. We don't have any tax on schools. We don't have any tax on, on chemical plants. But we have a tax on health insurance industry. Is that fair? That's not fair, right? If I'm a healthy, health insurance company, I'd be pretty pissed off. Because you don't charge tax for anybody else, but you charge tax on my industry. It's the reason why, because this health insurance industry, they operate very, very differently. Guys, what's the goal for every company? And give me a profit, right? The goal for every company is to maximize profit. Now, if you run a regular company, that when, you try to, when you try to maximize your profit, you probably want to sell more stuff, right? The more stuff you sell, the more customer you service, the more profit you have. For these guys over there, for insurance industries, that's not the same. For insurance industries, they can increase the profit by sell less policy. The reason why, now suppose, just suppose, everybody in the room, we're all in the market for health insurance. Okay, we all need to buy insurance. You guys are all very, very healthy people. I'm the only sick person over here. And then for this year, you guys pay your premium. And you never go to a doctor, you never go to a hospital. So how much you pay the premium is all kept by the insurance company. But because I'm sick over here, I need to go to a doctors. I need to go to hospitals. And for the entire year, I'm gonna spend $1 million for my insurance policy. And then your money will be used to pay for my policy. So one way for the company to increase profit, just don't sell to me anymore. Keep you guys. You guys are healthy ones. You don't need insurance. So when you pay, they keep the profit. So cut off all these sick people and they can make more profit. And that's what they did. So in 2009, 2009, this first company called Wheelpoint. Wheelpoint, their profit increased by $4.7 billion. At the same time, they lower number of policies by 4%. Those 4%, they're the sick people. Second company, Cigna. Cigna profit was $1.3 billion. And then compared to previous year, that's an increase of 346%. Increased by threefold. And how they did it? By lower number policy of 5%. And the next company, Humana. Humana profits was only $1 billion. Only $1 billion, but the lower number of policy by 11%. And the last company, United Healthcare, their profit was $3.8 billion. At the same time, they sold 3% less policy. So all this decrease in there, they're the sick people who got cut off. 
they're the one who actually need the insurance, but they don't have any more because their companies, they're a for-profit company. And that's why we have this extra tax on this industry only. Now, the last item is a 40% tax if you use our insurance. Well, that's pretty stupid, right? Because you force me to buy insurance. I have insurance now. And now when I use my insurance, you need to charge a tax on me? That's not fair. But guys, if you end up paying for this tax over there, I'll be very happy for you. The reason why that this tax is on a plan called a Cadillac plan. For all the insurance policies, they're not created equal. You have the good policies, you have the bad policies. So for the good policies, we call them Cadillac plan. And for the Cadillac plan, when they pay for the doctors, when they pay for hospitals, they pay more. So when you go to the doctor's office, when you, apply, when you file for insurance claim, the, the insurance might just pay half. But if you have a Cadillac plan, the Cadillac plan pays 100%. So if, if I'm a doctor, I want to see this Cadillac patient. I make more money for the Cadillac patient. So for companies, when they pay for the premium for the policies, for individuals, if your premium is over $10,000 per year, when you use a policy, you pay a tax for it. If your family premium is over $27,000 per year, when you use your policy, you pay a premium for it. So it's not a tax on poor. It's a tax on the rich, the super rich in the company. So the winner and losers. So winners are the patient with pre-existing conditions, so those who are sick before, and also working poor, and our Medicaid patient recipient, because our payment goes higher, and we're also expanding Medicaid, and then people with chronic illness. The losers, they're the health insurance industry. Well, I put a question mark on there. The reason why, because for one, it's gonna pay a tax, so that's bad. But they're also getting more policies, the more healthy people buy insurance, so that might be good for them. Now, next, super rich. Because for those people, if, you, if you're making more than $200 a year, and you have a Cadillac plan, you're gonna pay more tax for it. So your tax goes higher for the super rich. And the last one is some small business. So for business who hire more than 50 people, they're gonna pay insurance for employees. Does it make sense? Yes? So do you know more about the law now? Do you like this law now? Maybe, maybe not. Thank you very much.